Hello, guys and girls. The program you are about to hear will be both fun and educational, but it is not a substitute for medical advice. Although we are doctors, we are not your doctors. Hello and welcome to Travel Medicine. As always, I'm your friendly neighborhood internal medicine doc, Dr. J. Hi guys, this is Dr. Santos, your pediatric infectious disease doctor. Hey everyone, it's me, Dr. Ward, the ER doc. Hopefully you all had a delightful Thanksgiving and gorged yourselves on whatever your particular meal of choice is. Tofurky! Do you think you get the same post-prandial, post-Thanksgiving meal sleepiness on a tofurkey? I don't know, Santos. Were you <laughs> napping and watching football post tofurkey? How do you sleep in part at the same know. time? I wouldn't know. I hate tofurkey so much. I've never. I tried it once, and then I was like, never, ever, ever again. Did you guys hear the one about uh, why the turkey crossed the road? Why, why did the turkey cross the road? He wanted to prove he wasn't chicken. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Ward, do you usually do the preparing and carving of the turkey in your household? I usually get mine from Safeway, and, <laughs> and uh, it comes in a nice plastic package, and you just all you have to do is rip open the package, and it's ready for you. Ta-da! Homemade! If you've ever had to do prep work on a turkey, or really on any animal, you know that Often that's the closest a lot of people get to surgery because you have to start carving apart skin <laughs> and you get blood out of these things and it can be a little messy. A little, be, a little right. messy, just a little messy, sure. It's a good anatomy lesson though. Sure, sure. And I figured that in honor of at least all the carving and hacking that we have to do in seeing the blood drain out, that we would cover on this week's episode, Blood and ways we take it out and put it in to the body and the whole history of blood and bleeding and things like that. <laughs> Yay, blood. Happy Thanksgiving Yay. and Christmas. <laughs> <Blood>. <laughs> well, I mean, it's red. You have so. blood. <laughs> yeah, it's red. <laughs> Before we start getting into the finer details, why don't we jump across the world over to India? We haven't been there in a while. <laughs> That's right. We haven't been in a while. And, I don't know, every memory in India was a memorable <laughs> memory. <laughs> there were no half-steps in memory. <laughs> I try to forget sometimes, but I can't. One of those memories, I remember... Do you remember riding a little a little rowboat down the Ganges River? The holiest of rivers in India? It's just the sights and the smells were unforgettable. It was actually a gorgeous day. Morning of the day after the night walk that we took on the Ganges where we saw the religious ritual of burning of the deceased and burning the bodies and pushing the ashes into the river, exposing the bodies into the river. On the day after, the river looked gorgeous. It was clean. It looked clear. And our guide said that it was a spiritual experience to bathe in the Ganges. I know. I was thinking if any of that water got on me, I'd be saying, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. Oh, dear. <laughs> My thoughts exactly. I mean, all of us, and with the exception of the guide, none of us were Hindus and none of us were schooled in the tradition of, um, of Hinduism. So <laughs> when the guide wanted to show us what it was like to bathe in the Ganges and he started splashing water on us, <laughs> I became oh, the Wicked oh. Witch of the West and I started burning and screaming. <laughs> Oh, dear. <laughs> he should have asked your permission at the very least. So for those who don't know, way back in olden times and even in current times, the waters of the Ganges are thought to be cleansing and spiritually cleansing and physically cleansing as well. But as cities have grown up and there have been more bodies thrown into this holiest of rivers, it is not so clean. It is polluted. <laughs> and and a, splashing the water directly from the Ganges onto one's body is probably okay. Drinking it is probably not a great idea. And bathing in it, actually immersing yourself in it, is probably a worse idea in this current industrial day and age. Of course, we later found out that our hotel pumped its river water directly from the Ganges, so we were all bathing in it anyway. <laughs> exactly. 
<laughs> there you go. Now, there are some people who say that there are natural sources that keep it clean despite all of the pollutants, um, i.e. there are a lot of bacteriophages or viruses which destroy bacteria in the Ganges, but I still wouldn't take it at face value. Satoshi, I believe it, because remember in Star Wars... <laughs> <laughs> the, the force behind the force is actually a bunch of little bacteria in people's guts or something like that, right? Uh, those, those did you just did you just make the claim that there are midi chlorians in the Ganges? <laughs> That's right, there are midi chlorians in the Ganges. First That's of all, uh, midi chlorians are apocryphal and horrible things created by George Lucas in a fever dream, and may J.J. Abrams cleanse us of all of this. <laughs> As it's he, the force, it's the force. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when JJ when JJ cleanses up does this, is he going to have to use some form of mm, bloodletting to get these midi chlorians <laughs> out? One of the other aspects of of Indian medicine and Indian culture that I found pretty fascinating is that do you know they still use bloodletting there? Uh, unfortunately, I do. Yes, both. I believe just opening up the veins, phlebotomy type bloodletting, and I believe the use of leeches as well. Is that right, Josh? Yeah, they <laughs> use razors, oh, razors, yeah. tourniquets, and leeches. <laughs> oh dear! <laughs> I hope they're curing something. And the basic premise that they express is when you know they have to let out the blood when the blood goes bad, which is you know pretty much the same premise that. Blood letters have been using since the Greek ages to balance the four humors. Uh-huh. uh-huh. Blood, black bile, yellow bile, and phlegm, phlegm, which, when they were in harmony, were referred to as eukrasia, which is Greek for good mixture. Mm-hmm. And when there were problems, you had dyscrasias, or bad mixtures. Mm-hmm. What do they use the blood letting for? Is it one type, particular type of ailment, or is it across the spectrum of all sorts of ailments. Well, in India, they use it across the spectrum, from everything from arthritis to cancer to even headaches. Hmm. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, that's right. It'll probably take care of your headache in a hurry, I guess. And do you suppose, suppose there's any, I don't know, any clinical evidence or any empirical evidence or any even anecdotal evidence that this type of treatment works? Well, the interesting thing is we do still use bloodletting in the U.S. today, and we're going to get into that a little bit later, and Santosh will take us through it, as he actually had an entire presentation that he did on uses of bloodletting. However, before we get into that, I figured we would dance our way through this episode with a little bit of history and etymology. I'll save the etymology till later. I know you guys desperately crave those fun facts. Oh, yeah. That's right. We do. But let's go back to the early 1600s, early 17th century, when British physician William Harvey first discovered that blood circulates. Prior to that, part of the reason all these various doctors had been using bloodletting is that they believed blood was just stagnant. It sat in the veins, and you poked holes in your arm or your leg or wherever like a balloon and drained the blood from that section. Yep. And eventually, your body would redistribute it to fill up the area. But William Harvey discovered blood is always circulating. That's right. And I I actually remember reading about this, Josh, believe it or not, when I had participated in the play, the French play, The Imaginary Invalid by Moliere. <clears throat> And in this play, the the poor invalid who wants to take medicine all the time, and you know Moliere was actually making fun of doctors of the time for being crazy crackpots and whatnot. But one of the young doctors who came to the invalid's house wrote a thesis on the madness of the theory of the circulation of blood and other nonsense. <laughs> Uh, that was the name of the thesis. And I said, what do you mean the the nonsense of the circulation of the blood? And this is how I learned that once upon a time, we as physicians did not think blood circulated. But participating, did you mean, did you play the invalid? Did, were you... 
I I I played a, a hooded professor at the very end of the play, the imaginary invalid, in order to learn to treat himself we decide to make the invalid a doctor so he can just treat himself and stop relying on all these other doctors. So I got to play the part of one of the doctors. So you gave him WebMD access? We gave him, yes, the equivalent <laughs> of of the Renaissance WebMD access. We chanted at him to make him a doctor. <laughs> yeah. I just like That's saying the weird. word invalid. It's so politically incorrect. <laughs> Oh, it's terrible. But yeah, I like the idea that you could be chanted at to be made a doctor. I must have missed that part during my boys. <laughs> Me too. Josh, are you saying you were never chanted at? Oh my gosh. We didn't. I didn't pay for Kaplan's. <laughs> so as we said, 1628, it, the circulation, the fact that blood actually is constantly moving through the body, is discovered, and the first known blood transfusion is attempted. Uh, not. Too soon afterward, it was in 1665, where the first successful blood transfusion occurred in England, where physician Richard Lower kept one dog alive by transfusing blood from other dogs, who I'm sure were all very well cared for. <laughs> so let's just let's gloss over that. <laughs> However, the initial impetus behind using this in humans was also done in England by a physician known as John Baptiste Dennis, a Frenchman living in England, actually infused animal blood into humans with variable results. <laughs> However, there were some bad reactions from these trials that ended up resulting in the decree of Chatelet in 1668 that pretty much ended blood transfusion in Europe for the next 150 years. Well, ended blood transfusion around the world for the next 150 years. And if you guys are more interested in learning about that, there is a fantastic book called Blood Work, A Tale of Medicine and Murder by Holly Tucker, which actually talks about how the gentleman who Dennis transfused, when he died suddenly, it may or may not have been due either to the blood or to a secret cabal attempting to discredit this doctor and his use of blood transfusions. It was the blood. I'm sorry. What? <laughs> <laughs> when, when Mr. Denise infused animal blood into humans with variable results, I was like, wait a minute. I denies, think variable results. Denies. That's, that's, co that's coder. Yeah, euphemism. I deny it too. No. <laughs> that's euphemism for... Like everyone died, right? I mean, because well, let's let's put it I this way: I do not see how that could go well, well. There are some equine antitoxins which are still in use, so they they are highly purified. But what you're asking the patient to do before we had this era of purification and being able to take components of blood, what you're asking the patient to do is to survive the initial toxicity of all of the foreign proteins going into their blood. And if they survive that, then the antibody for from the whatever animal to actually aid in the person's recovery. So you were asking for a kind of a serendipitous series of events to come together and save this person's life. So I wouldn't be surprised if one out of a million times or something, it actually worked. So <laughs> well, it was actually one out of two. Oh, okay. because wow. Dennis had two patients. The first one like did eyes. okay. The second one died suddenly, okay. which is why there was a bit of conspiracy theory around it. Sure. The next time that we started dealing with these sorts of things. In fact, why don't we go to one of our founding fathers and what happens with bloodletting before we get into transfusion? Father of our country, George Washington. Mm -hmm. He of the fancy hair, wooden teeth, and cherry trees. <laughs> That's right. All, all apocryphal. I think you told lies. I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> do you? Do either of you know how he died? I did not. Uh, as as most people did in that era, he had an infection. I know he died of that infection, but I don't know any details beyond that. So he had a, what initially began as a sore throat, and developed into a cold, and what historians now suspect 
was probably a pneumonia. Okay. Of course, medical treatment at this time still involved a lot of bloodletting. George Washington was essentially bled to death by doctors who removed three, just a little over three and a half liters of blood from him while treating him for a cold. Three and a half liters. Within a few hours. Nice. Wow. Now, as a point of reference, and, and Ward, you can correct me on this, the human body only holds about five or six liters of blood. Yeah, the average, the average 70 kilo male only holds about five liters of blood. So to re remove a little over three and a half liters, they basically took out half of his blood trying to cure him from a cold. <laughs> Well, I think the good doctor, the good primary care physician for George Washington, essentially put him into hemorrhagic shock, in addition <laughs> to whatever problem he had before. Yeah, what I mean, is hemorrhagic shock? So hemorrhagic shock, it's a special type of shock where it's when your organs are not getting enough blood because you, you literally lost the blood. And there are several stages. The first stage is when you lose just a small portion of your blood, and everyone's a little bit different. Depends on your age, depends on your weight and blood volume. If you lose about you know 10% of your blood volume, your blood pressure might not change, but your heart rate might go up to compensate for the fact that you now have essentially lost 10% of your blood volume, and you don't have the blood cells to bring oxygen to your cells. The next step is when you're just beating your heart faster. Your increased heart rate is not enough to keep up with the loss of blood, and that's when your blood pressure tanks. And um, that's when, you know, people start looking pale. They might start sweating, cold sweats. And the next step is when it starts affecting the brain, and people might not be thinking clearly, and your all your organs go into, one by one, go into failure. And then after that, it's pretty much a, you fall off a cliff and you die. And the most common George causes Washington. of hemorrhagic shock are usually what nowadays? Uh, nowadays, it's probably trauma, blunt trauma from mm -hmm. car crashes, from um, mostly car crashes. Okay. So I'm going to jump in briefly with a little bit of etymology. So it sounds like George Washington ended up dying of hemorrhagic shock, right. even though it started from a cold. But... The process of bloodletting was done in these days by usually leeches. Now, here's a fun little fact. You guys, you guys know how much I love this sort of stuff. What do you suppose is the origin of the word leech? What is it? Well, I can actually take leech. this. Um, so, leech or leeching, actually, the, the name of the animal came from a word for physician or doctor. You are absolutely correct. It's from the Dutch Germanic word for healer, magician, physician. Okay. And that is because for a long period of human history, bloodletting was so much a part of healing in those days, and that's really the only method we had to get blood out, that the small blood-sucking animal came to be known as a leech because of its supposed healing properties, or tiny little doctor worms. <laughs> It was so, it was the primary tool of the doctor for a very, very long time. Nowadays, when you hear somebody is leeching off of someone else, <laughs> they're basically doctor-worming them. <laughs> doctor-worming. Yeah. Very nice. You're of welcome. <laughs> hemorrhagic shock, how would you treat it now? If someone comes in and they're in hemorrhagic or hypovolemic, which just means low-volume shock, so if you don't have sufficient fluid in your body to maintain your blood pressure, you don't have sufficient blood to circulate to your organs. How do you stabilize these patients in the ER ward? So actually, hypovolemic shock and hemorrhagic shock are similar, but there are two distinct properties. Hemorrhagic shock, you give blood back. In fact, you, give the, you do the exact opposite of what was done to poor George Washington. You don't let the blood out. You, in fact, infuse blood back. Even in certain cases of septic shock, sometimes we give patients blood. 
I don't know. We've kind of gone, you know, 360 on this on this issue. Mm. We do the exact opposite of letting out blood. We do we put blood back in now. And now hypovolemic shock, and the on the other hand, due to you know sometimes due to dehydration, due to sepsis, because fluids are leaked out into other spaces, that you can sometimes replace not just blood but some saline and crystalloids, lact- lactated ringers, and just to get the blood volume back into the blood vessels. That's a different type of shock. Now, would either of you ever consider transfusing anything besides blood into somebody who is having hemorrhagic shock? Uh, so besides blood or yes. uh, fluids, as, as Ward suggested? Yes. Well, let's say bags of saline weren't available okay. at the time. All right. Uh, I don't know what I would have done 400 years ago, but today we actually do give, other than just, we don't give whole blood anymore. We give blood products, so packed red blood cells, fresh frozen plasma, parts of blood clotting factors that help the blood clots. We don't give, we just don't give whole blood anymore. But that's today. That's in 2015. Well, well, from the 1800s, so not, not soon enough for Mr. Washington, but about another hundred years later, a lot of physicians got frustrated and discouraged with blood as a transfusion product. After all, there were very often reactions, and we didn't have Benadryl, and we didn't have things to prevent these antibodies and serum sickness. And we didn't so, even know that blood type mattered. Right. True. Yeah. So instead, there were a number of people looking for effective substitutes. And for a short time, the top substitute is something that I don't think either of you will suspect. So I'm going to ask you a question. Have you heard the phrase, milk it does a body good. <laughs> oh, yes. Josh, no. Oh, Santosh, yes. Yeah. Are you referring to the milk mustache? The famous <laughs> Aaron Burr. The 90s war. <laughs> Aaron Burr. <laughs> Aaron Burr. <laughs> well, for a period from about 1873 to 1880, milk was the blood transfusion substitute. And specifically in America, because really, whereas transfusion of blood in the 19th century or 1800s was more actively practiced in Europe and England, transfusion of milk achieved its greatest popularity in North America. And the first use of it was practiced by doctors James Bovell, which kind of sounds like cow, Bovell, <laughs> and, and Edwin Hodder in Toronto, Canada, Yay. during the cholera epidemic of July 1854. Mm-hmm. And I love this. So in their, in their original study notes, their case report, they thought that because it contained a lot of the same proteins found in blood yes. and that white corpuscles or white blood cells were basically just immature forms of red blood cells, that was their operation. We now know that there are different kinds of blood cells. Mm-hmm. They figured they could transfuse milk and it would achieve all the same effects as blood without causing the transfusion reaction from antibodies buried in it. And in his study, he says, Dr. Bovell and myself applied to the corporation, meaning the city of Toronto, for a good cow and a few articles indispensable for the comfort and well-being of the patient. These were refused, and we thereupon sent in our resignation. So they could not get a good cow to continue these experiments in 1854. They did not clear the IRB? Is that what happened? They, they did not clear board. the IRB. <laughs> and even though this was a theory, it was all done anecdotally, almost every patient, every case report of a patient who was transfused with milk, they shortly started to develop chest pain, back pain, headaches, and most of them died. And this was, they used cow milk initially, then the reactions took longer when to take place when goat milk was transfused, so they were thinking maybe it was just the animal itself. However, in 1880, another physician, Dr. Howe, who was really just sticking to this idea of transfusing milk, (laughs) <laughs> attempted one final experiment. He said, okay, cow milk, definitely bad. Goat milk, goat milk, slightly better, still pretty bad. People aren't surviving. So he said, maybe 
The problem is we need to determine if human milk could prove superior. Oh, of course. Yeah, that sounds like so, a good idea. <laughs> so, he t- hey, scientific method, right? Sure. So he attempted the infusion of three ounces of milk obtained from a healthy postpartum woman. Okay. One can only wonder how he obtained <laughs> this milk. Sure. sure. But the patient was a woman who had lung disease, and shortly after the transfusion began, she, like all the others, complained of pain in her chest and her back and stopped breathing after about two of the three ounces had been given. Oh, boy. However, she was resuscitated by artificial respiration and injections of morphine and whiskey. <laughs> Injections of whiskey. You, you guys, you remember around <laughs> around the eighteen <clears> hundreds. <throat> you remember morphine and heroin and all those things were pretty much the standard go-to. Right. Yeah. Automatic. Yeah. At the end of this experiment, Doctor Howe concluded human milk was no more suitable for transfusion than goat or cow, and even the amount did not make a difference. And this actually began the practice, or this heavily contributed to evidence-based medicine in the U.S. as some statisticians began saying, look, we can't rely on anecdotal evidence of these transfusions working. You have to collect all the overall cases and see that the trend is that this does nothing. And actually numerate them and, uh, and quantitate them and not just describe things qualitatively, which a lot of my mentors talk about in kind of a sad fashion that this was the beginning of the end of that kind of narrative storytelling method of medicine and the beginning of statistical analysis. But I think it is a great thing. It's an absolutely wonderful, wonderful thing for statistics to enter medicine, finally. I mean, this yep. poor woman had a lung disease, and I don't know how bad her lung disease was, but whatever it was, it... She got a cure that that stopped her from breathing, and... Well, she ended up surviving. Yay! Because, you know, morphine and whiskey. Right. But, (laughs) but again, I I couldn't find anything about whether the breast milk or whether the human milk was from her or donated from someone else. So, really, there are entire levels of uncomfortable in (laughs) this treatment. I'm going to go ahead and say it doesn't matter, that uh, it was a bad idea either way. Would it be less weird if it was your own milk? <laughs> no, it's worse. It's like, that, an, it's like it's, the cows that are fed with their own milk to be more tender and then... No, no, I, I don't think it makes a difference. If If it was my saliva or somebody else's saliva, it wouldn't make a difference. It does not belong in the bloodstream. Especially with the lack of knowledge that you know they were burdened with in terms of sterilization. Can I, just, can I just say that I think what really happened was that when you inject a non-blood substance into your veins, it probably caused a lot of clotting and you know clotting issues, and they probably all died of pulmonary emboli, which would explain the chest and back pain. Exactly, because so. sometimes you have uh, women in postpartum can get a little amniotic fluid into their bloodstream from just giving birth and they go in to disseminate it, all their blood starts clotting and that's what they die from. So maybe, sure. maybe that poor woman, oh, we'll never try whiskey and morphine for our <laughs> pregnant patients, but I don't know. Well, that's maybe you show. should. <laughs> <laughs> the next major advance in in blood work, I suppose, didn't come till about 20 years later in 1900 when Karl Landsteiner, an Austrian physician, discovered the first three human blood groups. And those are, of course, A, B, and O. A and B being two blood groups, A, B being their combination, and O being the absence. Mm -hmm. Now, before I ask you to, to maybe explain these a little bit more, Santosh, I'm going to just mention again, let's fly across the world. And did you know that in Japan, blood type is believed to be an indicator to one's personality? Whoa, really? Ooh. How yeah, so? In fact, there's, yeah. this is such, and, I, and I'll go into the different personalities in a moment, but in fact, there is such a market for blood type themed goods that include drinks, books, and because it's Japan, condoms. 
<laughs> that this belief is actually this belief is actually so prevalent that the Japanese version of Facebook has a blood type option on profiles. Wow. Okay. See, I don't get Japan. I get India more. <laughs> So this and is this is kind of like astrology, but with blood groups. It, that's exactly it's a, a, astrological science, and it's most prevalent in Japan. But other East Asian countries also subscribe to this theory. So yeah, the Japanese blood type personality uh, it originated with publications by Masahiko Nomi in the seventies, and research into this causal link is pretty limited. But the way the ones that they believe are type A, the best traits, they are earnest, sensible, reserved, patient, and responsible, but they are also known for being stubborn and fastidious. Huh? Type B, type B Japanese. blood. To... Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's basically scientific racism. Huh? Yes. <laughs> type B are passionate, active, doers, creatives, but they are also known for being irresponsible, unforgiven, and going their own way, which is another word for independent, which certainly in Japanese culture is usually frowned upon. Yes. And there's actually a proverb in, in Japanese that says, the nail that sticks out gets hammered down. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember that. Type AB is cool, controlled, rational, and adaptable, but also critical, indecisive, forgetful and irresponsible. All right. And type O is confident, self-determined, optimistic, strong-willed and intuitive, but also self-centered, unpredictable and a workaholic, which actually matches up pretty well with my blood type. <laughs> Your type O? I like I am type O. Uh, I am too. I like the first part. I I could I could do without the second part. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this this was actually a really interesting theory that is still, again, in, in place today. And, you know, you think astrological signs are ridiculous. It's no, I guess, no better or worse than saying, no, my blood type determines my personality <laughs> and probably has about as much influence on you. Right. So in a pinch, when I get shot, if I get shot, I should just look for a self-centered but confident man and say, hey, you. <laughs> Let me have well, to you're going to have to check the office because they'll be a workaholic. Oh, Jeez. gotcha. Now, Santos, you're our, you're our bench researcher, our academician. What can you tell us about the differences between the blood groups? What, act, what does a blood group even mean? Sure. So, the, essentially, we have little surface markers, and in fact, they're on all of our uh, blood cells, not just the red blood cells. But these little markers kind of help differentiate ourself from other. So in a very, very simple way, if you're type A, that means that the surface of your red blood cells, you can imagine them having little A's on them. And thus your your antibodies or the, the B cells, which detect other, so other than self, they will have not anti-A antibodies, because that would be self, but they will have antibodies against B and say, oh, okay, if I see any blood with B antigens sitting on top of the little blood cells, you can imagine little blood cells floating around with little Bs, not not Bs like bumblebees, but the letter B mm. yeah. <laughs> sitting on the surface, then those anti-B antibodies will go attack them and destroy them. If you're the opposite, if you're type B, that means you have the little B on the surface of your red blood cells, and you make anti-A antibodies. And if you're AB, then you do not make any of the antibodies. If you're type O, then you make antibodies to both A and B. So this is a way of kind of separating out what is your blood versus what is other blood? And this is one of the primary defenses that have been evolved in our body to say that if foreign blood invades our bloodstream, it gets attacked and destroyed right away in the cases of things like cross-contamination. For instance, if a human comes along and bites you, out of aggression, you don't want whatever infection they have. So we have evolved 
automatic defenses to kind of get rid of that blood right away. And another way of, I think, describing blood groups that'll be maybe a little bit different in terms of a, a metaphor is, let's call blood type A Cubs fans. Yeah. You're walking around, you have your Cubs cap on, your Cubs shirt, you're rooting for the Cubs. And anybody who shows up who's not a Cubs fan, you get into a mob and you beat them senseless. <laughs> And, and you'll type. know they're a Cubs fan because they'll be wearing their socks uh, paraphernalia. Well, I'd say if you're blood type B, yeah. you're a Sox fan. And you're walking around wearing your Sox hat and your Sox shirt. And if you see anyone that's not a Sox fan wearing their gear, you're getting into a mob and you beat them senseless. <laughs> sure. Yep. If you are AB, you maybe have a Cubs hat and a Sox shirt. You support all the Chicago teams. And you're pretty good. You're getting along with everyone. And there's oh, there's no mob. Bulls, just, yeah, there's no mob bulls. justice. There's, there's, and if you're uh, and if you're O, you have a Harry Potter shirt on and you don't pay attention to sports. <laughs> but if enough of your Harry Potter friends get together, you will beat up anyone in a White Sox or a Cubs paraphernalia. You will avada kedavra mm. the daylights out of them. <laughs> Either or. Wait, which and and. That? And the combos as well, because... You basically attack all the muggles. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. I was just really looking for that excuse. To use them. I've been waiting to use that metaphor for a while. <laughs> the Harry Potter. I believe it. I believe it. So, that, so those were discovered, and imagine that. Like, we did not know. For years and years, we've been bloodletting, we've been transfusing. We didn't know that there were different blood groups until 1900s. Right. And... You know, th this is wonderful information, and I always think about this, that we had to build this knowledge at some point, and it makes me think about what our, you know, our future students will say about us, you know, a hundred years from now. You know, it's like, oh, those morons, can you believe they treated cancer with chemotherapy? Oh, my God, you know. But damned if they weren't good looking. <laughs> so handsome. So handsome. So handsome. Especially that one with the beard. <laughs> Let's go over those historical records again. Travel Medicine <laughs> Podcast. <Yes. laughs> now, the next step forward in blood technology well, didn't occur till about World War II or shortly before. In 1940, mm -hmm. Edwin Cohn developed cold ethanol fractionation, which is the process of breaking down plasma, which is whole blood, into its components and products, which is albumin, gamma globulin, a bunch of different proteins, and all the different parts that make up blood are separated and become available for clinical use. And this is what Ward was talking about earlier when he said, you know, we don't always have to transfuse whole blood. Sometimes we can just give one separate function. So, Ward, what are the different parts that make up blood? In the clinical sense, when we do a transfusion, we generally target whatever that's missing. So if somebody lost a lot of red blood cells, we tend to give just packed red blood cells because that's what carries life-saving and life-preserving oxygen. Sometimes if somebody has a bleeding disorder and there are clotting factors that are in the plasma that aren't working, we tend to just transfuse the plasma part, which contains all the clotting factors, among other things, and some antibodies and um, um, other various other proteins that may or may not be helpful. And sometimes when, it's, when our blood is missing only one or two clotting factors, such as you know, when you're on warfarin or sometimes some type of a blood uh, thinner, we would transfuse just the specific clotting factor. And sometimes when you're taking, in addition to the red blood cells, the white blood cells, the plasma, our body forms clots ba uh, with the help of platelets. Those are little little particles in our blood that helps form little fibrin clots. It, essentially, a cement block that blocks off whatever that's, that's, uh, that needs to be blocked off. So those are the, sometimes when you're missing just the platelets or the platelets aren't working, you transfuse only the platelets. In review, packed red blood cells, white blood cells, plasma, and platelets. Those are the major components of blood. 
correct. And you know, in most cases, when you're bleeding, you, you in almost all cases, you do not need the white blood cells. In fact, the white the white blood cells can cause problems because they are the they're the immune cells that can end up attacking other tissues. So whole blood nowadays is almost never given. Yeah, now the white blood cells are actually used in my line of work where we can now prime certain white blood cells to go and attack an infection if we need it. So in rare instances, we use primed lymphocytes, specific white blood cells, or primed neutrophils, which are little eating cells and go and they eat up the bad guys so those can be transfused but as ward said only in very specific cases where we need to go attack an infection and the worry is always that the graft so the the transfused blood will go and attack the host or the the human that receives the blood and we don't want that to happen that began just before world war 1 that we found out we could separate all these different blood products. Did you know that, let's say you're stranded on a tropical island, mm -hmm. maybe uh, one that's Gilligan in nature, <laughs> and... Wait, somebody... have we just come back from a three-hour tour? Well, we've got the professor with us, <laughs> and clumsy old Gilligan has suffered some sort of trauma that has led to, say, hemorrhagic shock. What do you suppose you could do to possibly treat him? It's a little bit similar to a milk transfusion, but a lot less toxic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, we don't have any sterile saline. Um, no. If he can, if he can drink, and we have a, a decent source of water, we can give him water. Maybe he can drink it. But I wouldn't take any water off of the island and put it into the man's bloodstream. I don't. I suppose water. there are coconuts laying around. Coke. There you go. Are you serious? Nature's nature's IV bag. So coconut water is often sort of touted as a recovery drink because of the hydrating electrolytes that it has. There is a belief that can be used as a substitute for blood plasma in a pinch because it does possess some very similar properties to human plasma, and it can be safely injected directly into the bloodstream. Now, there was a small-scale study in 1999 published in the American Journal of Emergency Medicine that found the use of coconut water did serve as a short-term hydration fluid for a Sol Solomon Islands patient when nothing else was available. Oh, wow. Well, look, if Gilligan or the professor was able to make a radio out of some coconut husk, a piece of ham, and, you know, some fish bones, I don't see why not. Some sterile coconut water couldn't serve as plasma. <laughs> I was a big fan of Jackie Chan movies growing up, and I still am. Sure. And I remember on one, and I, I think it was Who Am I or Operation Condor, huh? there is a scene in which somebody needs a transfusion, mm -hmm. or at least volume back, and Jackie uses a coconut and bamboo, which as we all know is hollow, to make a instant IV bag. And they always thought, you know... I'm willing to accept that he can do all these ridiculous things, but that seemed like the stumbling block to me, and in fact, it was the most true statement in that entire <laughs> film. Wow. No, don't tell me Jackie can't fly. Jackie can fly. <laughs> well, of well, course, I, Ward, I, all Chinese people can fly. You know that. <laughs> We've seen it in every one of their movies. <laughs> That's right. It makes a lot of sense because coconut water does contain a lot of like, some sodium, some potassium, some sugar molecules that, that are similar to plasma. And, and you have and plenty of water. You would just have to keep it sterile. That would be the challenge. And coming out of the coconut, that's probably sterile. You'd have to get through the shell without getting those shell particles. And you'd probably have to set up a filter before it went through any kind of catheter to get into your veins. Because otherwise you'd have large particles trying to go into your blood and you'd set up a clot pretty quickly. But that's pretty Now I know. That's pretty I'm cool. I'm stranded on a deserted island. I've got saline bags all around me. <laughs> now, delicious, delicious saline bags. Oh, all you need is a needle. That's the problem. Bamboo. Were you not I'm listening? Yeah. <laughs> Bamboo actually can be fashioned into a narrow bore needle um, as long as the person's veins were, you know, if it wasn't a pediatric patient, yeah, you'd, you'd have a chance. 
So there you go, survivalists. <laughs> so the next sort of advancement in the whole process of these transfusions donations came in 1941 when the Red Cross began a national blood donor service to collect blood for the U.S. military. And that was Charles R. Drew, formerly of the Plasma for Britain program, was the medical director. And this lasted throughout the entirety of World War II, mm -hmm. where people were basically not quite drafted into donating blood. They weren't just grabbing hobos off the street and saying, give for your country. <laughs> but people were strongly encouraged. It was considered to be part of the war effort. Right. In 1970s, U.S. blood, blan you, you, bleh, US blood banks, <laughs> try saying that three times fast, <laughs> moved toward an all-volunteer blood donor system. When I first read that, I'm like, all-volunteer? Were we actually grabbing hobos off the street? <laughs> but no, in fact, all-volunteer they meant rather than paid, and that was to prevent people, these, these self-same hobos, from going in and selling their blood to get alcohol or drugs or even something to eat. They said, we're not going to pay you anymore. That's when we moved to the juice and cookies era of blood donation. Yes, juice and cookies era is awesome. However, it was a tradition, and to this point actually remains so to this day in Ireland, that if you donate a pint of blood, they give you a pint of Guinness to replace the iron. <laughs> oh, come not on. A bad way to, not a bad what way to go, to actually. What happened to defying stereotypes? <laughs> I did not make this up. No, I know you didn't. <laughs> I'm just telling my good friends in Ireland. <laughs> well, and it, it does have to be a dark beer to replace iron stores. Um, you know, a lot of the other lighter beers will not have the same amount of iron. They taste great, but they're less filling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we shoot in a commercial or a podcast. Come on, people. Can it be both? <laughs> it can. It so, can. now the most common kind of anemia, which is what blood transfusions are often used to do when it's not for hemorrhagic shock, the most common kind of anemia is iron deficiency anemia, meaning your blood requires iron to basically hold its shape, and that is what the oxygen attaches to is your blood as it's carried around the body. And when it gets to the various organs, it gets dropped off like a tiny little carpool. That's right. Hemoglobin is based on an iron molecule. That's where the heme comes from in hemoglobin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ooh, ooh. Can I, can I do an extra special um, trivia portion of the heme part and the iron? Take it away, Santos. Yay! So hemoglobin actually binds oxygen pretty darn well by itself. The big molecule of hemoglobin uh, will will bind oxygen. The real for that little bit of iron is that hemoglobin will bind carbon monoxide about 14 to 15 times more strongly than oxygen without that little iron molecule or without that little iron atom in the middle of the of the hemoglobin ring so that little bit of iron in the middle is actually super important so that when a car drives by you don't just soak up all the carbon monoxide and instantly fall down dead <laughs> it will bind up the oxygen, but that iron actually prevents you from getting carbon monoxide poisoning all the time. <laughs> ah, like right now. Like right, yes, yeah. <laughs> because there is quite a bit of you know carbon monoxide in the air. It's a it's a significant but very tiny portion of the air that we breathe. But of course, we want to bind up oxygen with a lot more avidity than carbon monoxide. So that's what that little iron atom does. So thank you, little cation. So thank anemia you. <laughs> So anemia is basically it's a lack of blood. A meaning without, the prefix for without, and emic meaning relating to blood. And the most common cause is iron deficiency. So there can be two problems with anemia. You're either not producing sufficient blood or you are losing blood faster than you make it. If you're losing blood faster than you make it, that's often because you're bleeding internally, 
which can be a hemorrhagic shock picture, or you may have an infection that is causing your blood cells to burst, or there may be some problem with their function and shape that means they die sooner than they normally would. And most blood cells, I believe, have a life of around 21 days. Mm -hmm. Sounds about right, huh? The If the problem is on the production end, then you may have a problem in your bone marrow where blood cells are made, in your spleen where blood cells mature, or you just may not be having enough iron in your diet so you don't have the components necessary to make blood. If you'd like to learn more about this in a much easier to understand and artistic way, I happen to write a children's book about the adventures of a blood cell <laughs> journeying through the body. Plug! Shameless plug! Shameless plug. You can, it's called Home is Where the Heart Is. It shares a lot of inspiration and influences from the magic school bus, but instead of Miss Frizzle and her class, it's actual blood cells and components of the body going on an adventure through the body. And it is available for sale on Amazon, on Barnes & Noble, and you can even find a link to it from our website at travelmedicinepodcast.squarespace.com. Yay! Cool. So since that covers anemia, or lack of blood, which would be the most common reason for a transfusion, Santosh, why don't we move into why we might still need to use leeches today, <laughs> and what conditions that would be useful for? Uh, besides the fact that they're just the latest fashion trend? Well, yeah, we all love Dr. Worms. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, they were a fashion trend for a little while around the 19th century when leeches were kind of at their height and use. No, leeches are actually wonderful at taking away excess blood. And yes, yes, I know, I can hear you people over the airwaves already. Who has excess blood? Well, the major point where actually the FDA has approved the use of leeches is where you reattach a flap of skin or a limb and you are trying to get the blood to circulate back into that flap of blood or back into that limb. When you're trying to get this to happen, blood has to flow in, that's arterial blood flow, and blood has to come out. Venous blood flow has to return back to the heart to circulate. Well, venous blood does not move under the same pressure that arterial blood moves under, so it tends to pool. And pooling blood has a larger tendency or a stronger tendency to clot. And we do not want blood to pool and clot because now the arterial blood can't get in, and you're going to maybe lose that limb or flap of skin. So the leech goes on there. It bites. It actually sucks away the pooled blood. And it also secretes a molecule called hirudin, which is also the name of the genus of the leech, Hirudo. And hirudin, or hirudin, will stop the blood from clotting. And it'll drink up that pooled venous blood, that excess venous blood, so that more arterial blood can go in and perfuse the tissue, the new tissue. And we have not yet found any medical technology which matches the efficiency of this leech to do this particular job. And so that's why we have gone back to this rather ancient method of leeching at the junction of a skin flap or a reattached limb in order to remove venous pooled blood for a short period of time while that reattached portion of flesh heals to the the original person, so to speak. Now, leeches tend to be used because of this uh, very often in some specialized surgeries in areas dealing with the face and neck, mm -hmm. which I believe is what part of your talk was on originally, Santosh, correct? Yeah, that's. I, I was dealing with the with an infection that came from it, but this particular child where they were using leech therapy, they were reattaching a flap of skin over the jaw. And the other condition that's 
often used that's more of a medical standpoint is hemochromatosis, which, again, going into the roots, heme, meaning iron, chrome, meaning coloration, and tosis, meaning I forget. <laughs> uh, but it basically means you have an excess amount of iron specifically in your blood. So your body is actually producing, as Santosh noted earlier, too much blood. And the leech is the easiest way to get this out. So the main treatment, if you have hemochromatosis, is phlebotomy or regular blood donations and draws. There is a story about a young Packers fan, I believe, who was trying to win tickets when the Packers were holding a blood drive. And he kept going back and donating over and over and over again and found out that he actually had this hemochromatosis. And if he had not been donating, his health would have been at severe risk. <laughs> it was only from the weekly, the weekly blood draws he was getting to try and win football tickets, which I think is a perfect Thanksgiving type story. <laughs> That's a beautiful Thanksgiving story. It is a little sad on another note that people who donate or who try to donate blood with hemochromatosis, I believe, Josh, they're still denied the ability to donate because they have, quote-unquote, a disease of the blood. But actually, their blood is perfectly safe, and right now I think it's going to waste. I believe you are correct, but I also think that it has been under review as to whether or not that is can be reconsidered safe blood to use uh, due to a national shortage. Right. And part of this is because, as we mentioned, blood only lasts about 24 days before you know it breaks down and expires. And in 1983, we found a combination of some additive solutions that extend the shelf life of blood cells to 42 days. Mm -hmm. Yep. And this helped a little bit, but, for example, after 9-11... There was a huge rush of people to donate blood. There was a lot of goodwill created in the country, and similarly, I'm sure there was a large rush to donate after the Paris attacks, after Beirut, after all these various terror-type attacks. But the problem is, is unless all those donations are used within 42 days, they just get thrown out, and then the blood banks are empty, because you can't give somebody expired blood, right. and then there's a shortage. So what the Red Cross and these blood banks need are regular donations, not one big rush. Right. Because blood, much like the 1800s donations, is a lot like milk, and that's an expiration date. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just grab the pint of blood that's in the back. <laughs> yeah, just, you go to the back. You've got to reach all the way in the back. You dig through. I just looked it up. Okay, osis is a suffix that usually denotes actions, conditions, or states. So hemochromatosis is a state or a condition of hemochrome. So too much yeah. iron and blood. So that kind of wraps up our, our short history of giving and taking blood. But I, as I was researching this episode, I did come across a few other random facts that I thought were pretty neat. Now, we talked about how organs have to be perfused or have a circulation of blood in order to gain their nutrients, in order to do all the things they need to do, or else they fail. But there is one part of the body that has no blood supply and extracts oxygen directly from the air. And for our trivia question this week, what do you suppose it is? <laughs> oh, I hope it's not an easy one. <laughs> it's it's better than in and mate. I and I won't even necessarily make you wait a week to find it out. <laughs> no, it's the human cornea. Ah. <laughs> there you go. No blood supply, and this is not the iris, which you can see the blood vessels in when you're hungover. <laughs> it's not the pupil. It is the actual cornea directly. Yeah. Now, a lot yeah. of people might have said the lungs, but believe it or not, the lungs have a redundant blood supply, which feeds the rest of the blood with oxygen, but it has its own blood supply that brings oxygenated blood to the actual tissue. That's right. 
Yeah. Well, that makes now, sense. That, that, makes, that makes sense that, you know, when I wear contact lenses, it allows only a certain amount of oxygen through, and if you wear them for too long, your cornea gets irritated from the oxygen uh, depletion. Mm-hmm. And yeah. can even get ulcerated from that. Now, another fact I found out, and this one shocked me, actually, <laughs> because I I lost a little bit of faith in humanity when I found this out. <laughs> oh, no. You're all familiar with the process of athletes doping, correct? Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. I thought that the one group that would be above reproach here would be participants in the Special Olympics. Oh, sure. Well, I don't know, Josh. If South Park taught us anything... <laughs> Timmy. <laughs> While well, true, I learned, in, in speaking of, of Timmy, yeah. that one of the common practices is that wheelchair athletes with spinal injuries, uh-huh. so they can't feel anything below the level of their injury will sometimes intentionally injure themselves on the lower bo- on the lower body such as breaking a toe or an ankle fracture because they can't feel it and their bodies will respond to these injuries by raising blood pressure and enhancing their performance. Oh dear. Wow. <laughs> now I applaud the person who first came up with this idea. Ingenious. Absolutely ingenious. I mean, if if people put half the effort into competing that they did into figuring out methods to cheat, <laughs> we'd already be on Mars. Sure. <laughs> the space race proved that back in the uh, 60s. Can you imagine wanting to win so badly that you'll break your toe just so your body gets a rush of blood? <laughs> God. <laughs> oh, boy. It sounds almost cartoonish, doesn't it? Is that, yeah. That's wacky wild, yeah. yeah. And the last fact I wanted to add in is another one that I also was very, very surprised to learn. In 1996, you all remember Saddam Hussein. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Commissioned, well, before I get any further, you've also seen Army of Darkness? Uh, I have not. I really should. The central figure of that Army of Darkness movie, or the Evil Dead movies, aside from Bruce Campbell, Mm -hmm. is a book called the Necronomicon. Oh, yes, yes, Uh uh-huh. Also created by H.P. Lovecraft. And it was said to be a mystical tome bound in human flesh and inked in blood. Right. Now, you might be asking yourself, what do Saddam Hussein and the Necronomicon have? (laughs) Uh, Are we going to bring up some Antichrist stuff? Because we're really not geared for that kind of uh, reporting. Uh, Actually, no, this is not... It's not meant to attack any religion. This is a fascinating fact that the religion itself isn't quite sure how to deal with. Okay. Uh, to, to celebrate his coming to power and his years of fruitful reign, in 1996, Saddam Hussein commissioned a copy of the Koran to be written in his own blood. <laughs> oh, God. Ew. Now, there's been a lot of controversy as to whether or not it was actually his own blood. Okay. Because there's no, he would have had to donate a huge amount in order to write an entire holy book. Sure. And there are a number of e- imams, I believe is the word, or religious leaders who have said that, you know, based on the things he did, his blood is dirty and therefore cannot be used to write a holy book. Right. But the fact remains, whoever's blood it was, it has been written. And now... Muslim leaders aren't sure what to do with it because to write the Quran in blood in general is haram or a sin because blood is unclean and dirty and you can't put the words of God down in that. But to destroy or deface any copy of the Quran is also a sin because, again, it is God's word. So what you have here is a real catch-22 yeah. where you can't do anything. And I, I bring it up more because the fact that somebody in the modern day and age would take the time to have a book written in blood at all. <laughs> that guy is well, the worst. That guy is really the worst. <laughs> you know, just fun fun facts about blood that I thought were worth mentioning. And that, I suppose, really <laughs> brings to an end this episode. Moving from bloodletting in India all the way to Saddam's Necronomicon. Well, we... <laughs> 
We can add one uh, other piece of... Uh, no, 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 that's perfect. want to end on. I, I can't think of it. You want to end on? Uh, I was actually talking about the sudden and scary rise of modern leeching. Josh, we did describe the proper and kind of regulated use of leeches in plastic, facial, and hand surgery um, to reattach limbs and skin flaps. But believe it or not, <laughs> there are people who are now called hirudotherapists and they will give out a degree in leech therapy and rather than FDA use for reattachment of limbs they want to give you leeches to put on your skin to actually drain your blood uh, as an alternative bio cure this has been going on since 2004, and oh my god, people are trying to leech uh, other people again. And I'm sure we're going to be hearing for uh, from uh, the Jenny McCarthy's of the world soon about the miracles of leech therapy. But for uh, please, please, people, stay away from this. It's horrible. Do not try to drain your blood with a leech to cure your ills. It's probably just a vampire in disguise recommending this. <laughs> yes. Yeah, if they're, if there's anything, They're getting craftier. Yes. The only thing we want you to take away from this podcast is don't feed the vampires. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a good lesson. That's a great lesson. You really should not feed the vampires. <laughs> And on that note, I think we will draw to a conclusion this episode of Travel Medicine Podcast. Join us again next week for another fantastically fun topic. If you like the show, please rate us. We're on iTunes. We're on Stitcher. We're, if you found us somewhere else, rate us there too. The more you rate and review, the higher we stay on the charts so we're easy to find, the more guests in various fields we can attract, and really everybody has a good time. So we appreciate all your support and look forward to bringing you many more episodes. Our theme music is composed by Rachel Ledger. All the references and articles we talk about in these episodes can be found on our Facebook page, and you can contact us all on Twitter. I'm at Dr. J Comedy, Santosh is at Toshifro, and Ward is at Travel and Medicine. All this information is in the show notes because we love you. <laughs> and until next time, guys, as always, happy travels. Keep your blood. <laughs> <laughs>